So I'm going to repeat some of the same things that Lamar did repeat because I wanted to make sure that we drill home the fact of the work of NATO and some of its board members. So first and foremost, it is a great honor and a pleasure for me to assume the role of president of the National Association of County City Health Officials, better known as NATO, not Nacho. I first would like to offer my appreciation and gratitude and unswerved support for my friend, my colleague, my predecessor, Dr. Georgia Heiss. <laughs> you know, me and Georgia Heiss have known each other now since 2000, 2001. Um, from the great state of Kentucky. And we often had a lot of battles on public health within the state, but we accomplished them together with a, a great array of people. She has been a powerful voice on behalf of NATO and local health departments across the country. And especially so during this year, when we have faced multiple challenges, including dealing with infectious outbreaks such as Ebola. NATO's Board of Directors, thank you profusely for your leadership and your service, as do the thousands of our members. Job well done, Georgia. In partnership with our highly accomplished and respected Executive Director, Dr. Lamar Hasbrook, I commit to provide the leadership Nature requires, in order to achieve its objectives and implement its strategies. I am committed to listening and responding to the needs of our members and working closely with our board of directors. Nature is your association. It is your professional home, and with your steadfast engagement, Nature has become a leader and a catalyst for promoting health equity, social justice, combating disease, and improving the quality of life of people where they live. Those who have heretofore steered nature along this dynamic road have done so in a responsive and measured way. With diligence in ensuring the continuity of nature, many people have contributed to this outcome, far too many for me to name today. I would like to congratulate and welcome our new and re-elected board members. Please stand again. <laughs> and lastly, the entire annual conference work group and the chair, Ruth Mariana, and, and Marie Burton, and Jessica, Please stand. Now, if you don't know this, now the person that usually stirs up the board on most meetings is usually Rex. <laughs> <laughs> Nature Annual Conference continues to be the largest gathering of local health officials in the United States. So as incoming president, I would like to take this opportunity to thank you for attending and supporting the work that we do on your behalf. Thank you to our partners, exhibitors, and sponsors who support this important work every year. I believe this is the best conference in the world for local health departments. And let me say this now, it is an incalculable honor to accept the presidency of NATO, an organization with a grand and glorious and audacious history in representing local city, city health officials, county, local health departments, and health of individuals and communities across the country. I am humbled by your faith in me, and I promise to assume this role as to serve as much vigor as I was trying to pass a smoke-free policy in your county. <laughs> yeah. As I stand before you today, I want to reflect on a few things, because usually, you know, my path into public health has been quite different, as you can see. 
So I believe in, in all thy ways acknowledge God and he shall direct thy path. We must begin to envision our future. We must begin to create that path. And today I would challenge you into taking that first step. I want to reflect back on my public health journey, which started at a very early age. As a young boy, I witnessed something that I understood was different. I was walking with my Aunt Earlene Hughes. She was a direct, matter of fact type of woman. Get in your face, she didn't play. She asked me a profound question, and it was profound to me because I was only seven. She said, what do you want to do in life? And believe it or not, I had an answer at seven. I said, I want to go to college, and I want to be an architect, and I want to play college football. And the reason I wanted to be an architect, because my family told me, see, I was an artist. Artists don't make money until they die. So you got to make money while you live it. But it was interesting with that response. I told her, I didn't want to be like the homeless guy that was on a corner. Homelessness is a public health issue. A few years later, I learned from my parents that that homeless guy's name was Skip. And they actually went to the same high school with them. The name of the high school was Parker High School on 6th Day Normal. South South Chicago. Turns out Skip was in the Vietnam War and he experienced some disturbing events. He returned back to Chicago, unable to find a job, and eventually began developing, deliberating mental health issues. That was an early introduction into mental health and coping with trauma, and a glimpse into the institutional challenges that plague public health system today. After that, I recall vowing that I would never join the military. <laughs> yeah, so much for that. So while deployed, I encountered PTSD. Approximately 50% of my unit came back with PTSD. We was involved in over 100 plus events in 360 days. Every three days, I knew something was going to happen. Mental health is public health, and it will be one of our greatest challenges over the next decades. One afternoon, when I was riding my bike, I noticed something I had never seen before. It was a beautiful park with sidewalks. It was clean, green grass, nice basketball courts. The basketball courts actually had nets. Now, this is something I wasn't used to. So my natural curiosity got the better of me. I rode through the park. I got off my bike, and I began to walk. Before I noticed, a crowd began to gather, and they were whispering. So I quickly made my way out of the park. The crowd of boys began throwing rocks at me and calling me the N-word. So I quickly crossed the street, and I threw rocks back. <laughs> they didn't raise no food. I wasn't going to throw rocks in the park. So the interesting thing about it, my mom protested in the 60s in Chicago, but she failed to tell her son about racism. I was 13 years old, and I had never left the neighborhood until that day. That park is now integrated, and it's on 71st and Pulaski, and it's called Marquette Park. That, my friends, was my first introduction to racism, social equity, and health and all policies. Those are public health issues. When I was a teenager, a few years later, I would ride my bike to Hamilton Park and Ogden Park on Saturdays to play basketball and football. I sometimes would play games with Benji Wilson and Marcus Liberty. So for you non-basketball fans, Google this person. They did a 30 for 30 special on ESPN. 
Benji Wilson was shot one day. They took him to a non-trauma center on the south side of Chicago. He died from a gunshot wound while laying on the bed for hours in a non-trauma center on the south side. He was the number one basketball player in the nation. Instead of taking him to a trauma center, they decided to take him to the nearest hospital, knowing there was no one there that could save his life. There was no one there to do surgery for over two or three hours, and his mom was a nurse. And she knew when his feet turned cold and blue. The family sued and won a lawsuit for $10 million, which was Jordan's rookie contract they compared it in court, the first time that it ever occurred. Nick Anderson, former NBA player that now lives in Orlando, was his best friend, and he wore number 25 in honor of his friend and former teammate from Simeon High School. And Simeon High School is nine blocks from Robeson, where I played football and ran track. So some of the name stars that came from this school is Derrick Rose, plays for the Chicago Bulls. Jabari Parker, last year's number two draft pick, played at Simeon High School. He went to Duke. So Benji's untimely death at the age of 17 was a precursor to today's gun violence and access to health care issues. Gun violence and lack of access to health care is public health issues. These early experiences was leading me down a path and began to define me as a person. As I concluded high school and went to college and returned to the South Side, I noticed the degradation of housing, poor education, and lack of investment in our community. Does this sound familiar to you? Has anything changed since I first noticed this in 1990? Many people believe that sports are a way out of impoverished neighborhoods, but that's a wrong supposition. I was a football and track star, but I understood I need to get an education. We have to provide more resources for our youth to survive and thrive. You all know what it takes. It takes resilience to do the work that we do every day. There's an increased need for local public health departments to address both new and traditional public health roles, such as gun violence, police policies, violence, trauma centers, health care, and social justice. Today, just as in 1990, we face similar challenges and pitfalls in mental health, racism, education attainment, gun violence, social equity, and social justice that we need to address. We need to remove barriers through sound business approaches, greater collaboration, social bonds, and better policies that foster growth and opportunity instead of creating barriers for the next generation. We need to invest in our youth to compete at a global level. I could have easily been a cash to or another brother lost in the streets through an unjust systematic policy against populations made vulnerable. Public health has come a long way, but we need more action and less rhetoric. Envisioning the future, creating our path, speaks to that change. As a local health officials, we must broaden what we do, perceive our roles in leading our counties and managing our agencies. This starts by increasing local health departments' involvement in decisions that affect our communities, including developing better relationships, working with police departments, urban planners, and bankers. We need to expand our resources for population health approaches versus medical model approaches. My vision is that we need to embrace foundational capabilities and request adequate funding for essential public health services and continue to prove that public health matters without putting us into a pigeonhole. We need to define public health, not anybody else, we. We need a path and being leaders, I challenge us to create it today. That's not overlooking the great work of the past, but rather looking at what is needed into us becoming chief public health strategists in our respective counties and cities. We need to change the status quo and stand up 
for our citizens that don't have a voice. Foundational capabilities, social justice, and health equity is my call to action as your president. I recently returned to the streets of Chicago and I saw a neighborhood further degraded than I had ever seen before. There were only a few families living on the block with many boarded up homes. When I entered Paul Robeson High School in the 1980s, enrollment was 2,000. Today, enrollment is 489. And it was recently reported in the news, my old neighborhood, Inglewood, is labeled as Shah Iraq. My freshman class had 700 students, and we only graduated 224. What happened to those students? What happened? Too many of our cities are being dismantled due to poverty, gun violence, drugs, lack of access to care, and subject to police violence. My challenge to you is become involved in your communities beyond the four walls of your building. And I make this specific challenge because even today as I drive, I still have mental flashbacks of being pulled over by the police. I shouldn't feel like that now. And I'm a grown man, African American man. So imagine what our youth are feeling in these cities. Help shape the policies that reduce debt due to violence, such as Mike Brown, Eric Gardner, Trayvon Martin, Tamir Rice, Freddie Gray. That's premature mortality. Premature. We are losing youth to the streets where they should be growing up in these seats. Let's make our community safer and healthier, no matter the income or education attainment. Our communities are in a state of emergency. Our youth are in trouble. So if you don't know, I just throw a statistic because this happens in different subgroups of our population. African Americans make up 13% of the population, but 50% are in jail. 60% are on death row. But I would say, I don't want to get into the incarceration rates. We need to spend more money, not on the jails, but maybe on a homeless population. Maybe to send a kid to college. Recent protests are a clear indication that our communities are asking for change. Not a handout, but a hand up. We are in key positions to affect that change. As chief health strategists, we can influence policies and change to reduce the mortality in the hospitals and in the streets. Let's make the phrase of social determinants of health a thing of the past. Everyone needs equal access to health care, good wages, and education. There shouldn't be numerous barriers for one to become successful. Our community don't need a hand out again. They need a hand up. These problems that I'm telling you today are not just African American problems. There are not just Hispanic problems. There are not just minority problems. These are America's problems. My president's challenge to you is to take me up on that challenge and do what you need to do to improve our communities. Because one thing for sure, not only, not only do black lives matter, but all lives matter. Thank you. <laughs>